All right, hello everyone. Thanks for attending today's webinar, Google Apps for Building Leadership. Uh, while you wait for things to get started, please feel free to take the three question survey in the middle of your screen, kind of off towards the right of the slideshow. And if you are watching the archive of this presentation, we will still receive your answers. So we'd really appreciate your feedback too. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items for the presentation. At the bottom of your audience console uh, are multiple application widgets that you can use during the webinar and while watching the archive. If you have any questions during the webcast, please click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We'll try to answer these uh, during the webcast, but if a longer answer is needed, if we run out of time or if you're watching the archive, <clears throat> we will answer later via email. We do capture all questions, again, including those submitted while watching the archive. If you're watching the live session with us, we encourage you to share ideas or ask questions through the blue group chat widget. It has two speech bubbles on it. Michael will also be posting links to additional resources throughout the webinar in that group chat area. A copy of today's slides and additional information is available in the green resource list widget that looks like a folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand the slide area by clicking on the maximize icon in the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. You can minimize any of the widgets by uh, clicking the minimize icon in the top right corner of that particular window. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the webcast, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you in an email earlier. Feel free to share what you're learning on Twitter through the Twitter widget that you see at the bottom of your screen. All right, so let's get started. My name is Katie Seamer, and Michael Rausch is with us too. Like I mentioned before, he's sharing links in the group chat area and helping answer questions in the Q&A. Make sure that uh, he'll let me know if uh, my audio goes out or if something's not looking right to the live audience. So we are your hosts today, and we are very happy that you are spending your Wednesday evening with us. So very quickly before we get started, a little bit about Forward Edge. Um, Forward Edge is a K-12 technology company, and when I say that, I mean that we do all things technology for schools, including selling hardware, setting up and managing wireless networks, and we even have our own cabling team that will pull and run cables and hang APs and move projectors. Um, for some schools, we'll staff their technology team or supplement their current technology team. Um, so we really can be a one-stop shop uh, for technology needs for schools. And now we've even begun to focus pretty heavily <clears throat> on the curriculum and technology integration side. So that's where Michael and I and our department comes into things. And once you have that technology, how do you use it effectively in the classroom for teaching and learning? So in the CNI department, as we call it here, uh, we come with an education background and classroom experience. And in short, we offer visioning and planning services, provide professional development, and serve as on-site integration coaches to schools. And so here is our agenda for uh, the webinar today. If you haven't joined us in one of our uh, free Wednesday once a month webinars before, uh, we try to keep the content presentation as close to 30 to 45 minutes as possible to allow the remaining time in the hour for a live Q&A and any questions that come up. So today we're going to focus on a handful of um, calendar tips to keep everyone on the same page with your uh, building and district level leadership meetings. Uh, some Google Docs tips uh, for sharing uh, building and district documents with everyone, uh, and some things to help with document navigation. We're going to focus on some slides tip or, uh, you know, uh, presentations and for Google, Google Slides. 
we're going to look at sheets and forms and how you can use those for data collection and analyzation of that data. And then we're going to look uh, briefly at how you can automate some of these uh, tasks that take up your time. And uh, before we get started, in case you haven't heard, Google has rebranded their uh, Google Apps for Education. It is technically no longer called uh, GAF or Google Apps for Education. It's now called G Suite for Education. So this little image here uh, was put out on Google's blog uh, and just kind of summarizes how you and your team can, can get things done from all over the world in separate places and keep things streamlined. So going right along with our focus today and how we can apply that to schools. And in that same email uh, and blog post that went out from Google to announce this uh, rebranding uh, and some of the additional features that will be coming out with some of their tools, I wanted to point out, uh, I love this highlighted passage right here. Uh, research shows that each week we spend the equivalent of three work days on common tasks like emailing, scheduling, attending meetings, and gathering information, and only two work days on the roles we were hired for. So I think that's really important to keep in mind as we move through um, just some of the things that we're going to point out to you today in this uh, little webinar. Um, and then again, just all, you know, we certainly don't have time in uh, our 30 to 45 minutes or even the full hour to point out everything that you could do uh, to streamline these processes here that take up so much of our time. But uh, just kind of the biggest advice is just consistently keeping that in the forefront of your mind. Um, and, you know, constantly thinking, how could we use Google and these free tools that we have to solve uh, these problems and make our lives easier? So before we dive in, uh, starting out with some calendar tips, uh, I just have a quick question up here for you that I'd love if you could answer in that presentation area. A quick poll. Um, do you feel like your leadership team is as efficient as they could be? Um, and we'll see. I'll give you about five more seconds to answer that. And again, if you're somebody who's going to tune in to the recorded uh, archive version, you can also answer and we'll get your answers then too. All right, so go ahead and submit if you haven't. Okay, and that's 100% uh, no, I would agree. Um, I think most people don't feel like their leadership teams or, um, you know, even all of us individually are quite as efficient as we could be, which is probably why you're tuning in to this webinar in the first place. So we'll get started. Uh, looking at uh, some calendar tips, I'm just going to briefly cover this because I feel like most people um, are starting to really use uh, online calendars, whether it's Outlook or Google Calendar, whatever it may be. But you know that once you go into Google's calendar and uh, double click to create an event, um, you have some options here that even though people are using uh, a, a digital calendar, I don't see them utilizing some of these features quite as much, especially um, in schools. I just think we forget about them sometimes. Um, but first and foremost, when you pull up uh, to create a new event, you have an area where you can add guests. This is by far the number one uh, easy thing you can do to keep everybody on the same page when it comes to meetings. Uh, and all you do is you'll just click in that little guest area where the arrow's pointing, and you just start typing their name. Um, and, and what you need is actually their full email address. But by typing their name, Google will pre-populate uh, a list of folks either in your domain or people that you've attended meetings with before. And then you can just click on them and you hit add, and then everyone is sort of shared with the same calendar invitation. So for the rest of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, everyone has that. So if the meeting changes time, days, location, um, any, any notes or documents that they would need to go along with the meeting, everyone has that all in one spot. This is a huge help for keeping everyone's meetings on the same page. In addition to inviting individual guests to the calendar event, uh, Google has this handy tool, and if you don't have any rooms set up, it's right next to where you, over on that right-hand side, 
right next to where you would add guests to your room, you can actually add individual rooms. Um, at Forward Edge, we not only use it for some of our conference rooms, but we also use it for some equipment too. Um, so if you don't have any rooms or uh, shared equipment set up yet to utilize here, talk to whoever the admin person is in your tech department for uh, your uh, Google services. And they, on the back end, can add commonly used rooms, conference rooms. Um, maybe you have, uh, I know in my past at some schools I've worked at, when we had really large training sessions, uh, there was shared projectors or even microphones. Um, so you could add things like that that are shared. And then each one of those rooms, actually, uh, it creates its own calendar for that room. So anyone who's looking to, uh, you know, hopefully use the conference room, they would see, oh, no, it's already in use. Um, and it would show you that it was conflicting and you couldn't use it here. So uh, that's also something that may help some of the secretaries or admin assistants uh, manage some of the rooms. And when you're adding guests or rooms, um, there is now this handy little feature uh, that you can actually click suggested times right underneath uh, the, the list of all the guests and rooms. And with part of the G Suite rebranding, this is going to get even better. So if you're not seeing it just like this in your calendar uh, invitation area, it's going to roll out to you soon. But it just clicking that really quickly, you get a pop-up window, and it will tell you, um, you know, how many participants can make that day and time. So it will also help with scheduling meetings so you don't have to email back and forth over and over. Hey, can everyone make this day and time? Uh, I know that can, can clog up people's email inboxes as well. <clears throat> One of my favorite things about Google Calendar is the ability to add attachments. So um, right there, you can add a Google document, uh, you know, or any documents that you're going to discuss and go over during the meeting um, right there on the calendar invitation. So I especially love it for meeting agendas. Uh, you know, we've all sat in meetings that had a goal and we didn't have an agenda and then the meeting got off task and you leave wondering what you just sat in this hour long meeting for. You didn't accomplish anything because you didn't have anything guiding the conversations. So uh, with the added bonus of attaching it as a Google document, um, when you save the calendar invitation, it will also automatically make sure that everyone who you've invited to this meeting has access to that Google document. So right there, um, you can share it with them, give them editing permissions so that people can edit along the way and, and add uh, their items that they need to, um, you know, leading up to the meeting to make sure that nothing gets missed. And it doesn't have to just be Google Documents, FYI. If there was a PDF or something that you needed to add it here, uh, you can do that as well. Um, so, so huge benefit that gets overlooked a lot just right there in your uh, meeting invites. And one last thing that we're going to look at in the uh, Google Calendar. Uh, right underneath the location, there is this option to add video call. And when you click that button, it will automatically convert and give you and all of the people that you've invited to this meeting a link to a Google Hangout. Um, if you've ever used FaceTime or Skype, um, if you haven't used Google Hangouts, it's very similar to that. So anyone who um, couldn't join the meeting face-to-face -face would right there, everyone in the same calendar invitation, all you have to do is click that join meeting link like you see it right there in the calendar invitation. And then everyone is uh, put together in one live uh, video Google Hangout. So, um, you know, if somebody had to stay at home, snow days, you can continue meetings um, together. If somebody can't make it in uh, any district level leadership teams, maybe like principals meetings, uh, DLT meetings, things like that. Uh, it's a great option to just throw in there uh, just in case somebody can't make it. They could still attend virtually, even if they're not there physically. So that's it for the calendar, and we're going to move in to uh, docs and slides with just a couple of tips. So I have another poll up here for you, and I'm just curious how many people who are attending are already using uh, Google Docs and slides 
to collaborate together at the same time. Um, I often still see even schools who are using Google Apps, uh, people are still using uh, PowerPoint and emailing it back and forth uh, for people to add or, you know, they're, they're working on their individual pieces in a Word document um, or maybe a Pages document in a Mac environment and emailing those back, to, back and forth. Um, and, and I don't see leadership level people uh, always using Google. So go ahead and submit if you haven't. And okay, so uh, that what I just said holds true for um, everybody so far uh, attending the webinar. Folks are not using uh, collaborating together on Google Docs and Slides. So a couple of quick uh, Google Docs tips for you. One, uh, what easier way to share uh, building level or district wide uh, documents and information, faculty handbooks, uh, even student handbooks, um, anything that you need uh, schedules, maybe, you know, sometimes teachers need to know what other rooms, contact information, everything that you typically give out at the beginning of the year, hard copies for, or a lot of times things that are located on a network drive, um, you can create a shared folder. Uh, I do recommend doing it with view only access just so other people can't get in there and edit any of the documents um, or change anything around. But you can share out an entire folder uh, with view only access to your entire staff. And um, then from there on out, any document that you would put in there, uh, it'll be view only access to those people. They get changes right away. Uh, there's no re-emailing or, you know, having to wait to the next faculty meeting to hand out the hard copy uh, of the update, um, whatever it may be. And then everyone has access right there to that information. Uh, so super fast way to distribute um, in information and documents uh, on a broad scheme. Something else that we don't see a lot of people using that uh, could definitely come into play, certainly in the classroom, but uh, definitely uh, at leadership level, going back to some of those larger documents that you are required for maintaining, putting together, uh, distributing to staff, um, using headers inside of Google Docs. Um, that when you use headers, one, uh, it makes reading the document a lot easier. It's just like if you're used to using headers in Word. Um, makes reading it much easier because the important pieces stand out. And then it also makes creating a table of contents super easy. So here's a, a quick little image for you. And it's going to show you how easy it is. All I do is highlight the text. I go up to the normal text drop down, apply my heading here. And then to insert a table of contents, you just go up to insert. It's the last thing. You hit table of contents and Google Docs will automatically search for all the headers that you've applied and create a table of contents out of it. And then if you need to go back in, um, you know, add anything or remove anything later, uh, you just go apply or, or delete that section, apply those headings, and you can just click in the table of contents to refresh it and it will re-update it with all of those headers. And so then if I click any one of those areas in the table of contents, it'll jump me to that location inside the document. So for some of those uh, larger documents, uh, you know, faculty staff handbooks, uh, policies, um, you know, visioning documents, things like that, uh, using headings and table of contents makes it super easy to, to navigate the document. So anything you can do when reading on a computer to help people navigate is helpful. And uh, Google actually recently rolled out an update with the table of contents. You, you now have two options when you insert the table of contents, uh, either just as you see it with no page numbers, or you can even now, it will add the page number automatically and update that as you edit the document too. So another super handy update for us. Another navigation tool in Google Docs is bookmarks. So um, for me, when I use a table of contents, I'll often insert a bookmark, which again, you just go up to the insert tab and it's right above the table of contents and you choose bookmark. And then it inserts that uh, little bookmark icon right next to your text. And then what I will do a lot is actually uh, in my footer of my Google Doc is I will put something that says, you know, back to the top or back to table of contents. And then you can actually hyperlink to any bookmark 
um, within your document. Um, so that's the way that I use that a lot. There's certainly a number of other ways that you could do it, but all you do is highlight the text and insert link. And then when you click in that link area, instead of inserting a URL like we normally would for a hyperlink, you just expand the bookmarks area and then select whichever bookmark you added. And boom, now that will, wherever I click, it jumps me to that spot, wherever that bookmark is in my document. So again, anything you can do uh, to help people navigate, uh, especially large documents that, that leadership teams are often dealing with and creating headers, bookmarks, table of contents, super easy way to help folks with navigation. Last thing that I want to point out uh, with a Google Doc, and actually this little tip will work um, in any of the Google uh, applications, slides, sheets, uh, drawings, docs, etc. Um, when you are adding comments and feedback, so again, great way to kind of work together, uh, you know, oftentimes at that leadership level, it's not just one person owning the, the document or, the, you know, this policy, it's either multiple people in the department or, you know, everybody on the cabinet, whatever it may be, um, you know, and so add, using comments, which just like adding a little sticky note and it highlights the area of the text that the comment is referring to, but if you do the plus sign and then start typing the person's name, you'll see here I was doing, I was adding one for Michael. And um, so I can actually select Michael's email address. It, it kind of auto pre-populates as I'm typing his name and narrows my options down for me. So I type the plus sign, type Michael's email address or select his name. And then whatever I write in that comment, because I've started it out with that plus sign email address, it's actually going to send an email to Michael with whatever I include in that comment. So if you're using Google Docs to, like for this example that you see, I've got uh, tasks and, and topics and to-do items for people. So I want to make sure Michael doesn't miss item two because um, he's in charge of that. So by using that plus sign, it's going to send him an email with whatever feedback I give him so he doesn't miss that uh, piece or that comment, that feedback that I'm giving him. And then a couple of quick uh, Google Slides tips that we're going to look at. So thinking of uh, building and district leadership, um, you know, often, you know, I'll, I'll take a, a board meeting example. You know, oftentimes one person, maybe the treasurer uh, is responsible for, or, you know, maybe an admin assistant is responsible for compiling uh, everyone on the cabinet, any special guest speakers, all of their presentation items into one uh, PowerPoint or one slideshow. So what they do, everybody works on it, then they email their individual pieces, and then that one person is uh, scrambling last minute usually because everybody's trying to get all their update, most updates and, and changes in. And then they're stuck uh, kind of piecing everything together and, um, you know, put it, compiling everything into one area. Well, why not for some things, you know, create one Google slideshow and you can share it and collaborate together just like you can in a Google document. So here I've highlighted over on the left hand side, um, you can see those little colorful uh, tick marks. Uh, it looks like kind of teal, pink and purple. That's indicating to me that I've circled up at the top. I've got the individual uh, icons. Um, those little colorful marks on each slide indicate to me which person is working on which part of the slide or on which slide. Um, so I know, okay, so-and-so is working on this slide. So by creating this one slideshow, sharing it with everyone who needs access, um, or at least maybe everyone on the cabinet uh, together, then everyone can contribute to this Google Doc at one time. Um, and then again, because it's live updated, uh, you can continue working on it. Uh, actually, up until, uh, I wouldn't recommend this, but up until that board meeting or whatever meeting is starting, um, and then no one has to worry about refreshing, re-updating uh, any kind of last-minute PowerPoint that's going to be displayed and getting the right flash drive to the right person. Another handy feature, and this is pretty recent within the past couple of weeks uh, with that whole G Suite rebranding, there's a new uh, Explore tool, or at least the Explore tool uh, does some different things. So when you're in slides down at the very bottom right, 
you'll see this little uh, plus sign. And when you hover over that, it, it'll change and say explore. And one of the cool things that it will do in slides is actually suggest uh, formatting and layout options for you. So if you're not really a design person and you struggle to make these, uh, you know, kind of long and uh, forgive me for saying somewhat uh, boring presentations, uh, more enjoyable or at least appealing to look at. Now you can use this explore area to apply some of the layouts really quickly. So um, again, back to that multiple people sending their, their bits and pieces uh, to one person last minute. This will also kind of help keep things looking uniform um, and, uh, you know, quickly add those layouts. So I've got another quick poll up here for you, and I'm wondering how many people, or sorry, not how many people, which spreadsheet program are you using to analyze data? Uh, either Google Sheets, Excel, Numbers, or maybe you're not really using spreadsheets at all to analyze any data. So I'm just kind of curious what, what people who are, are watching are using. And again, if you're attending the, or watching the archive, you can still respond and it just kind of helps us frame uh, future training. So we do appreciate you responding as well. So go ahead and submit if you have not already. And let's see. Okay, so it looks like uh, everybody or at least everybody who's responding to the poll um, is using Excel currently for any kind of data analyzation. And I will admit um, I'm pretty much a, a Google Apps person for everything uh, in my life, but um, Excel was the one thing that I was holding on to for a really long time because uh, I did some advanced formulas and doing charts and pivot tables and things, and, and I just felt like at the, um, you know I, that Google Sheets wasn't there. Um, however, I'm happy to say now that um, I pretty much only use Google Sheets. Uh, because their formulas are so close to Excel now. Um, there's add-ons that anything that it was missing uh, from it compared to Excel, you can do now, so on and so forth. So I'm going to walk you through a few examples now uh, with, with Sheets and what I like. And I'm actually kind of pairing Sheets and Forms together with some of these tips. So I think a lot of people now are using Google Forms to collect a lot of data. I know a lot of teachers are catching on and using Google Forms for their assessments. Um, you know, people creating class rosters out of Google Forms, uh, collecting staff survey information. Holy moly, there's really kind of uh, endless options what you could do with uh, Google Forms to collect information. The reason this is catching on so nicely is because when you create a Google Form, if you haven't created one yet, uh, it, Google Forms will automatically set up a Google spreadsheet for you. And it for every question, it automatically creates uh, a new column uh, for that question. And each time a form is submitted, it puts the, the user's response on a new row. So super quick way to collect data information, assessments, and have it all on a spreadsheet so you can run reports, use formulas, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, once your information is in a spreadsheet, all kinds of stuff, like I mentioned, that you can do with Sheets to analyze that information. Uh, I'm going to walk through an example. And I am going to take uh, a, an, a, using an example for a TBT or a teacher-based team. Um, and if you're, if you're tuning in and you're not from Ohio uh, and you don't, that's not what you call it in your state, um, this is really something that teachers will get together, same grade level or content teachers, and they will uh, examine data, pre and post assessments, and then they have to examine uh, subgroups or by demographic categories to make sure that, you know, everybody's on an equal playing field um, and some reporting that goes back to the building leadership team, which then goes back to the district leadership team and then gets reported toward to um, the state of Ohio. So we're going to look at an example of how you could use sheets and, and some different things to uh, help those TBT and uh, BLT and DLT and all the alphabet soup meetings go uh, much faster. 
So looking at the spreadsheet that you see here in the presentation area, um, you can see down at the bottom I've got multiple sheets. Um, I'm currently on a student demographic information sheet here. So we've got uh, the whole Disney crew with us um, here today. So on here I actually exported uh, this information from Dazzle. Uh, which is our uh, state reporting system that keeps all the student demographic information in it that most schools in Ohio use, not all. Uh, but uh, you will notice the little lock symbol. In, uh, in fact, I obviously changed the names. That kind of goes without saying. But um, so right here, uh, and, and it's a protected sheet. So, you know, one person in the building would manage uh, this sheet. That way, if you have kids who transfer, uh, you know, move into the district mid-year, you can keep that updated with their information. But you don't want everyone in the building uh, or on the team being able to edit this information, uh, you know, probably by mistake would be would be the main thing that would happen. But so what I would do is, is kind of create the sheet and set up all the formulas and then have teachers make a copy, uh, you know, just share the whole thing view only with them. So then they have to make a copy in their uh, leadership teams to actually use the sheet uh, with one another. So if I flip over to my scores sheet, that first sheet down at the bottom, uh, I actually use formulas which will pull in all that demographic information for just my students or you know the, the students that I'm looking at here. And by entering their ID number, uh, which you know connects with Dazzle and everything in the first column, I have my formula highlighted here. That arrow is actually pointed to um, the formula that I have right there in column B2. And then so it, it's modified a little bit for the rest of the columns, depending on uh, what it's asking for. But just to walk you through this, it's a vertical lookup formula. Um, and if this is interesting you at all, Michael is, again, sharing links in that group chat widget. So pull that up if you need to. Um, but this is a vertical lookup formula, and this formula, what it's doing is it's telling Sheets uh, to check cell A2, so you see equal V lookup, that's the formula, and then that first thing where it says A2, so it's telling Sheets, uh, look, look right here on A2, what's that ID number? Okay, then I'm going to scan my student demographic sheet that we were just looking at a moment ago, and uh, all the cells and, and information that's on that sheet. And I'm looking, and if, if I find a match for what I have on this sheet as one that matches the first column on the student demographic sheet, so that if it matches the NID number there, it's going to pull in column two, or again, I'll flip back to it on my student demographic sheet. You see here that column two is first name. So it's going to pull that first name uh, column and then the rest of the information will follow suit and it's going to pull it into that cell automatically. So as you can see uh, right here everything just says NA, NA because I've got all my formulas set up so that as soon as I plug in the ID number it'll pull in all of that information. So when I just hit my uh, ID in column A Boom, it pulls in all of their demographic information there that again came from Dazzle and it's being referenced on my student demographic sheet. And again, if this is overwhelming you, it's, it's, it's more just to be an example to show you the types of advanced things that you can do with Google Sheets. So I'll go ahead and plug in all of my students ID numbers that I have and so it pulls in all of their demographic information. And so now I want to add my pre and post score columns. So uh, from columns D through I, um, we've got uh, pre and post score information here. So column D is their individual score for their pre-assessment. Column E is the total amount of points that it is out of. And then column F just does a quick uh, percentage calculation for me. Same thing for G, H, and I. That's just their post scores. So I'm going to go ahead and enter that information in there. Uh, and so then, um, again, I just do quick formulas in columns F and I to calculate the percentage. And then in column J, I have a quick uh, 
calculation or formula that calculates their growth. Um, you know, did they um, improve? Did they stay the same? Or did they actually revert um, and do a little worse? And then in column J, my growth column, I also have some conditional formatting set up. So it will automatically hide, and all of this happens just after I enter my scores. It does all these calculations and, and color coding for me. Uh, it, it set up so that if there is a positive amount or anything above zero, the cell will turn green. So if they show growth, it'll sh it'll that cell will turn green. And then if they stay the same or actually do a little worse on their post assessment, the cell automatically turns red. So I immediately can see, okay, which kids uh, didn't have any growth there. And that's just a straightforward uh, conditional formatting. You can also set it up to be tiered. So, you know, if they, you know, got uh, showed growth of 10% or above, it could be bright green. Uh, you know, if they uh, stayed the same, orange, if they went backwards, bright red, you know, different things like that. So there's a number of different things you can do. Again, this is just a quick example that I'm trying to highlight the advanced things that you can do with Google Sheets. So then, once you we've got our ID numbers that put in our demographic information, I've entered all my scores, it did the calculation, now I want to analyze by my subgroups of, of demographic information. So I am going to use filters and, oops, excuse me, it looks like this uh, got out of order just a little bit, sorry. So to apply a filter, I am just going to click, I've, I've tried to highlight it here as best I can. Um, you just click the filter icon in your toolbar, and once you click that, you should see all of these little blue drop-down icons in your header row. So then, when you click that uh, little blue drop-down icon, it will show you all of the answer uh, responses here. If I'm just trying to look at one subcategory, so we will look at um, ethnicity for this example. So if I hit the clear button and then only check uh, Hispanic, we're going to look at Hispanic speaking students or Hispanic students today. Um, and then it will show me just those students, uh, just my Hispanic students or whatever other subcategory I might be uh, looking into at this time. So now I will only see the results for those Hispanic students. And I could use formulas if I wanted to calculate averages, uh, average growth, uh, average growth, or average uh, percents or, or scores achieved on both pre and post assessments, whatever it is you're analyzing. But now there's also, I mentioned that Explore tool. And this Explore tool also exists in Sheets. And so when I click that Explore tool, it's located in the same place in Sheets as it is in Slides. So when I click Explore, uh, I get a little window that pops up for me. And you can actually use the Explore tool to ask Google Sheets questions about your data. So, you know, if you had one person kind of setting up uh, all of the formulas who, who maybe was a little bit more savvy in Excel or Sheets, set up the formulas, share this out. Then, then those people using this sheet wouldn't necessarily need all of that training to set up advanced formulas and to do all these advanced calculations. They could simply plug in the ID numbers, the scores, and then use this Explore to ask questions about the data set. So here you can see that I asked, um, what was the average growth? So in column J, it's looking for um, ethnicity Hispanic, which is in column M, uh, is my ethnicity column here. So it told me, and I can see here, that my average growth for Hispanic students was 5.3%. Um, so just by asking a quick question, uh, Google Sheets will now give me that answer through the Explore tool. So I know um, some other schools, I've seen uh, district leadership teams um, who will use Sheets to try to collect uh, multiple test scores for students um, in one area or, or one sheet. And so they'll have multiple people adding that information to the same spreadsheet. Um, I know sometimes people get a little worried that, okay, but then they can edit anything in the spreadsheet. Good news, as I pointed out before with my student demographic information, that was a protected sheet. Only I had access to edit that. 
So um, you can do this with entire sheets or actually just specific ranges, um, you know, specific cells or, or group columns um, that you can narrow down to either give people edit access or remove edit access so they can't uh, mess anything up that you don't want them to. So to do that, you would just click on the sheet uh, at the down at the bottom and you'll get this little uh, pop up. Uh, it's not a drop down. I guess it's a, a drop up screen here and uh, choose protect sheet. And then you'll name uh, the sheet or range. And you'll either tell it if it's a range of cells, which would just be a group of cells that you'd select, or the entire sheet. And then you'll set the permissions. And within that uh, permissions, you can either just show a warning. So if people do need access, but you want to be extra careful that they don't, you know, enter data wrong or delete it or whatever, you could just give them a little warning. Or you can actually restrict who has access to either yourself or specific people. Um, if it was specific people that you wanted to give access to, you would share it the same way that you would, um, you know, share an entire Google Doc with them with their email address. Uh, so that makes uh, collaborating together on Sheets with data and important information really easy when you've got multiple hands in there. It's easy to, to have people uh, kind of overwrite things, so this would protect that from happening. So I've got another poll, if you wouldn't mind to answer, just to give me a little feedback here. Uh, are you using add-ons to automate uh, processes? So Google has, has what's called add-ons. We're going to talk about it in just a second. But are you using add-ons to automate any processes uh, for your uh, daily job? Either yes or no. So go ahead and respond and hit submit if you haven't just yet. Yes. Okay, good. So we've got some people who are already using add-ons. That is awesome. Um, so hopefully we'll talk about maybe some different ways that you can use add-ons today. So um, add-ons are fantastic. They, um, you know, if you're used to Chrome extensions, they work a lot like Chrome extensions, only um, they are in Docs, Forms, and Sheets. Uh, Google Slides does not have add-ons, or at least not yet. Um, and they just essentially add functionality to that particular app. Um, the one caveat when you're using add-ons, <clears throat> it works in that particular program. So if you're going to use an add-on in Google Docs, you're not going to be able to access that add-on when you're in Google Sheets or in Google Forms. You're only going to be able to access that add-on in Google Docs uh, right, right there uh, for Google Docs. You would have to go install a different add-on uh, or, you know, usually the functionality is pretty different between the, the apps. Uh, but you'd have to, to, to use an add-on in Sheets. You have to install it in Sheets. I hope that makes sense. So um, here's an example for you of a task that um, a lot of buildings could automate. Um, you know, as building leadership, you probably spend a lot of time on discipline. Uh, I've been working with some schools lately, I think Michael has as well, uh, to get their discipline referral form created in a, uh, a Google form instead of a paper copy. Teachers spend a lot of time filling out paper uh, for discipline, then it has to be turned into an admin to fill out, then it gets given to uh, either the admin or the, an administrative assistant to enter into some system, so on and so forth. A lot of passing hands, a lot of manual processes here. So by taking that paper form and putting it into a Google form, uh, you can simplify that process. As we know, when we create a Google form, responses are collected in a Google Sheet. Uh, so then, once the responses are in a Google Sheet, admin can actually go in, add a couple of additional uh, columns to give their feedback, uh, action that was taken by the administrator, any notes, so on and so forth. Then, if you use an add-on in Google Sheets, it's in Google Sheets, it's called Autocrat. There's a couple of them out there. That's just the one that I have the most experience with. With Autocrat, you can actually then, uh, you, you put what's called tags or merge fields inside of a Google Doc. So you set up your template, and then you put your little merge fields in the places in the Google Doc 
that you want the information from the Google form to appear, an autocrat will automatically generate a Google Doc for you so it's easy to read um, out of the fields that were submitted, fields you choose from the Google form or from the spreadsheet. And it can also include those additional columns with administrator action. On top of just creating that uh, Google Doc, it, it can also be set to email certain people, maybe a principal, an admin assistant, um, that teacher who submitted the referral. It can email them that Google Doc so they can see the action that was taken by the administrator. Um, then you could print the Google Doc, uh, maybe send it home with the, the student to have signed by the parent. Um, and, and file it away if you, if you need a paper copy of that. And then you have all of that data and information inside of a Google Sheet uh, to run any sort of reports uh, and do any of that filtering and, and different things that we looked at in some of that those examples. So um, again, teacher fills out a Google form. All that information goes in a Google Sheet. An admin would enter what they did. Autocrat would run, create a Google Doc uh, with those all those fields added to the Google Doc automatically email that Google Doc to the teacher with the administrator action. Then you can print the Google Doc, uh, have the kid take it home. Uh, that process becomes much more streamlined, uh, fast, easy to manage. So there are so many add-ons. Um, we don't necessarily have time to go through all of them today, but here's a few that I thought might be helpful uh, for uh, building and district leadership teams. Um, and, and you can just kind of check those out. Again, if you want to look at some of these add-ons more in depth, if you click that green resource widget down at the bottom of your screen, the first link should take you to a link uh, with the actual live Google slide uh, presentation. So you can access that if you need to, um, to check out uh, slide 39 and with uh, the rest of these um, add-ons here for you if you want to look at those uh, anymore. And um, so now I'd love to know, uh, after seeing some of those different things that you can do, and again, uh, with such short time, some of it's more to just kind of highlight and show you some of your options that you have. But do you think that Google Tools, uh, everyone who responded at the beginning thought that, uh, no, their, their leadership teams could definitely be more streamlined and more efficient. So do you think that Google Tools could help you streamline uh, processes with your leadership teams? Yes or no? So I'll give you a second to think about it. And go ahead and hit submit if you haven't already. And we'll see what people think after seeing some of these examples. Awesome, yes, okay. So people do think uh, that, that this would, uh, Google Tools would help them streamline uh, processes with their leadership teams. Awesome. So just a couple of quick things before we jump into, uh, this was kind of a, a longer webinar, but we'll still have about 10 minutes for, for Q&A, which is nice. Um, so just a couple of quick things before I can start taking some questions from you. Um, if you are in the uh, Cincinnati area nearby, we do an on-site, it's four days, um, and it's actually broken up into two-day increments just because uh, trying to have a sub for four days is darn near impossible, and in four days is information overload. So um, we do a four-day on-site boot camp featuring a lot of information about uh, Google tools and um, a number of other web tools that you could use in the classroom. The next one that we are hosting on-site at Forward Edge, uh, we're located in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, will begin on November 10th and 11th. And the second half of that four-day boot camp is December 8th and 9th. So um, early bird pricing for that actually ends tomorrow. Um, so if, if you want to do it, and seating's limited, um, so if you want to do it, you're interested, go ahead and get yourself registered by tomorrow so that you can get that $50 discount um, from the boot camp. And you can register at forward-edge.net slash pdbootcamp. And again, uh, there's a link in the resource widget, that green folder icon down at the bottom. There's a, a boot camp information link right there that'll take you to it. 
We also do, uh, don't forget, these webinars that you're a part of. We do them the third Wednesday of every month at 4 o'clock Eastern. Uh, hopefully you answered that survey at the beginning uh, with some feedback. So moving forward, if that's not the best time for people, we might be able to um, adjust that as well. And these are completely free. So, you know, forward the, if it looks good, forward it out to your staff, forward it to anyone. Um, you know, it's completely free to attend these webinars. So now I would love uh, to take questions from you. So please, if you have any questions, uh, share them in the group chat. Looks like Michael has been sharing all kinds of awesome resources there for you to check out um, some additional information about what I shared. But uh, feel free to share them in the group chat or the Q&A widget down at the bottom. And since I don't see any questions right now, I just want to make sure that people don't miss it. Uh, you can get one contact hour for attending this webinar. So um, if you go to, and again, down in the resource widget, there's a link that will take you directly. Uh, and Michael just shared the link in the group chat. Uh, this is a Google form. So again, kind of modeling what we were talking about. Um, and I have to 100% give credit for this uh, automation to Eric Kurtz. Uh, he is awesome. He also lives in Ohio. Um, and he did a, uh, a webinar on actually that, that whole process, uh, video PD and in some of this. So uh, I actually got that idea from Eric. So what happens, uh, you go to a Google form and there's five questions to fill out about the webinar. And then all your answers go into a Google Sheet. And if you get four, there's some formulas involved, obviously, and some add-ons. Uh, if you get four out of the five questions correct, uh, we use Autocrat to automatically generate a certificate to you with uh, your name, uh, and it emails it to you, and all of the fields based on what you fill out in the form, um, and then some other formulas that we have on the sheet. And then it will, Autocrat will then email you if you don't get at least four out of five that you did not successfully uh, complete or, or meet the requirements and, and you need to take the quiz again. So you can take it as many times as you need to, but um, that is a, a perfect example of how you can put some of this into practice. Um, and again, got to give credit to Eric Kurtz for that. Um, he is awesome. So yeah, Michael just shared uh, a link to the Google Educator group uh, in there for you. Uh, so uh, that Eric is uh, one of the leaders. I'm, I'm a co-leader with Eric um, for Google Educator Group Ohio, if you're in Ohio with us. So any questions, uh, please feel free to share. And I'm going to share that link. I'm going to actually share the link to in the chat uh, directly to Eric's um, video PD where he has all that information um, because, you know, if, if that looks good to you, if you would like to do something like that, you know, maybe a certificate for PD for your teachers, anything like that. Uh, he's got the links with all the formulas and it'll walk you through how to use all of that and, and he just shares them uh, for free. So there's that uh, to get you started if that interests you at all. So if, uh, if there's no further questions, we are just about up with our hour. So I will go ahead uh, and stop uh, the live webcast. Um, again, remember that you can get uh, all of the links to um, the presentation, uh, the quiz for the contact hour. We'd love if you would fill out the evaluation form. It's really short. Just give us some feedback. Uh, on the webinar, uh, and then any boot camp information. Uh, all of that can be found in the resource list widget now or on our webinar page, uh, forward-edge.net, uh, forward-edge.net forward, forward, forward slash webinars. Michael shared the link for us. Sorry, a lot of forwards in one sentence there. Um, Michael shared the link. 
So if I do stop the broadcast, you're still kind of checking things out. Um, if you're watching or if you're watching the archive, you need to get back to it. Um, all of those links can be accessed from our website as well. Um, and again, if you have anyone in your district that you think might be interested in some of the topics that we talked about here in this webinar or some of our previous webinars, um, please feel free to, uh, you know, forward that, that link to them. They can always watch the archive, fill it out later, uh, the, the quiz, get their contact hour, so on and so forth. And our next webinar, uh, just as an FYI to let you know what's coming up, next month will actually be on November 16th and we will be looking at Google Chrome extensions for diverse learners. So that will be next month, mark your calendars, November 16th, Chrome extensions for diverse learners. You can register for it now so you get email updates, don't miss it, get the archive link um, and, and that's really it guys. Thank you so much for uh, attending with us live and if you're watching the webinar Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of the week.